Welcome to our morning service here at Graceway Bible Church. It's great to have you with us today. It is our prayer that you will be blessed. Please join us as Pastor Dan leads us in worship. Good morning, Graceway. It's good to be here to worship with you all. Uh, today, we want to look at the topic of purity, which is something we all struggle with because even though we're born again in Christ, we still sin. We still fall short of God's expectations, but he is still just and loving. He knows that, and he has paved us the way to forgiveness. And this isn't something new for us. This is something that David went through too. In Psalm 51, he's writing after his sin with Bathsheba, and he is repenting of his sin. He's coming before God, and he's laying out his case as to why he needs God's grace. First, he lays it out, and he asks God for a clean heart, because he knows he sinned. And then it's in verses 14 and 15 that I find something remarkable. In the midst of David's confession, he says this, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, that my mouth may declare your praise. David's repentance, David's confession doesn't leave him with the feeling of guilt or being weighed down with what he's done. Instead, his confession and repentance leads him before a just and gracious God that leads him to sing of all that God has done for his forgiveness. So church, today, just take a moment, quiet your heart before the Lord, confess your sins to him, repent, and then we will rejoice in what Christ has done. Oh, Father, we know that we have fallen short of your holy and perfect plan. We know we have sinned against you and you alone. Oh, Father, through the blood of Jesus Christ, please forgive us. Please restore the relationship that we could never restore ourselves. And may we sing with great praise, knowing that you are both just and faithful to forgive us our sins. In your son's name we pray, amen. Let's celebrate.
so much for sending us your son Jesus for the forgiveness that you offer us through his sacrifice on the cross I pray that all of those who hear this message today would come to him and accept the forgiveness that he offers accept the life that you give through him father thank you so much for giving us love when we deserved condemnation May we always respond with songs of joy and praise at your marvelous deeds in your great name. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Now, before we go to Pastor Don for an update, if you all would take out your cell phones and text someone you would normally say hi to on Sunday mornings, but this time, let's put Pastor's message into practice and text them one thing that you are grateful for, whether in general or or about that person specifically. So do that, and then we're going to go to Pastor Don for an update. Pastor Don? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just texting my good morning. Thank you very much, Pastor Dan. I want to say good morning from Graceway Bible Church. I'm actually up at the church today. I'm down in the kids' area recording the announcements. When I came in to record the announcements today, I happened to see Mr. Denny and his son Scott up waxing the floors in the gym. Uh, we just want to say thank you to them for that, for them coming out to, to work on that project there. Um, the, church, um, the church is open. Um, we are getting our mail. Uh, we are paying our bills. Uh, these things are, are, are going on. Uh, so I just want to assure everybody of that. We want to spend some time this morning uh, discussing uh, the kids' ministries and what we have going on now and what we are planning for in the summer. Uh, the youth group is continuing to meet. Uh, the youth group meets on Wednesday nights at 7, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Uh, we're doing a series on family. We're also in the Book of Romans as well. Um, if you're part of the youth ministry, um, we're thankful that you're participating in that. Or if you're looking to connect, please reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to have you be part of that, that ministry with us. Awana, though not physically meeting, there is a Graceway Awana Facebook page. They are uh, periodically posting updates. I see some of the kids in there uh, posting themselves, doing their verses, 
Uh, Mr. Danny uh, has a message that he, uh, that he shares um, periodically in there as well. So we encourage you to connect up with that Facebook page. Then as we look towards the summer, we have ministries like Camp Mercyville, Push the Rock, VBS. Um, these are all ministries that we're thinking about. As a staff, we meet weekly um, on Zoom. Uh, we meet and we discuss all the ministries of the church and we're thinking forward about what the summer will look like. We're planning it in two directions. One, as if things will continue as normal. And also we're making plans that if we need to alter our approach to these ministries, how do we do them remotely? Is there something that we can continue to, to offer to the children and to the families of the church? So if you could hold those ministries before the Lord in prayer, uh, we strongly uh, ask you to do that. Um, we don't know what the, what the future is going to hold. Uh, we just commit those things to the Lord. And if you could pray for those ministries and the decisions that may, need to be made, we would be so thankful. Now, Pastor Dan is going to lead us in prayer. Dan? Thanks, Don. Now, let's go to the Lord um, prayers, if you can. Uh, join me, sitting or kneeling. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for all that you have given us. You have provided such an abundance of good things for us. We have shelter. We have food. We have friends and family, and we have technology that allows us to interact even when we are separate. Father, I pray for those who do not have these blessings that we share. I pray that you would use us to bless them and that you would use your church to reach into their lives and help them, and that you would give them strength and wisdom in these times. Oh God, we are your children, and yet so often we stray. Father, we have lusted after so many other things besides what is good and what is pleasing to you. We have allowed our eyes to wander. We have given our hearts over to their own wicked desires. Father, we have been prideful. We have sought to show that we know what is good and replace our version of goodness. Put that on the throne instead of yours. Oh, Father, I pray for all these things and many more. I pray that you would forgive us, that you would purify us through the blood, sacrifice, and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. For without him, we have nothing. Father, take everything that we delight in, that you don't delight in, and replace it with forgiveness. Take every desire we have that is not in line with your will and mold it, transform it, refine it until it matches your will. For Father, you are good, and we are are only at a best a reflection of that goodness. I pray that you would transform us until we perfectly reflect that goodness that is so modeled in Christ. May we take this day as an opportunity to know you more, to come before you and to do your will. And Father, I pray for our, your church here at Graceway. I pray that you would provide what we need in manpower and financially, in facilities and in wisdom, that you would provide all of these things that we may do your mission here on earth. I pray that you would, we would be wise stewards of all that you have given and that we would use it only for your glory. In your son's name we pray, amen. In all my years in kids' ministries here at the church, one of my favorite things to do is to watch Mr. Denny giving one of his object lessons from here in the Sky Room. Uh, but now Mr. Denny has a lesson to us coming from his home. Mr. Denny? I would like the children, if they could, to move in, not only to hear me, but to see what I'm about to do. The Bible talks a lot about sin and the effect that sin has in our lives, that God hates sin. And so we learn that sin came into the world through Adam and Eve, 
And through Adam, sin is passed on to everyone. We're all born with a sin nature. We know that sin is everything we think or say that or do that breaks God's word. And that breaking God's word is sin. God said that all of us are sinners. And God also said that the wages, what we earn, what we deserve from our sin is death. And that death is the death of a relationship with God. God, without sin, cannot have us come to him with sin in our lives. And so we cannot go to heaven. We cannot be part of God's family. But God solved that problem because he loves us by sending Jesus. And here we have Jesus. He comes into the world. He's God, but now he has flesh. And he grows up without sin for the purpose of going to the cross to take our punishment and pay for our sins on that cross. And so that's exactly what Jesus did. And I want to show you that. Jesus, without sin, while on that cross, God lays the sins of us all on him. And what does Jesus do? He paid for those sins. And because he did that, our sins can be forgiven. But how are you forgiven? Here you are, I am, all the people with sin in our lives. The Bible says it's clear. It's by faith, by believing in Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God wants you to have everlasting life in heaven. So here's what happens. We have sin in our lives. Jesus is on the cross. He paid for our sins. There has to be a point where you believe in him. You ask him, you say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, so you admit you're a sinner. And I believe that you are God's son, that you took my punishment and paid for my sins on that cross. And I want to commit to you. I want to give my life to you. The moment you do that, or anyone does that, Jesus comes into your life. And look what he does. He washes your sins. You're without sin, and you look like Jesus. You're just like him. And Jesus said th that he doesn't want us to continue in that sin any longer. And so I want to show you something else. Here's a problem that we have. We have us, and then we have Jesus. And the moment we put our trust in him, we look like him without sin. But as we continue to live in this world, what ends up happening is that we are tempted by the world and what the world's doing. And the world's full of sin, isn't it? And Satan tries to tempt us to do what we want, not what God wants. We disobey God. And so what happens with a believer whose sins have been forgiven by Jesus when he sins again? Well, let me just put Jesus over here for a minute and put this glass here, repentance. When you sin, what happens? In the beginning, it's only one sin. And maybe it's not a big deal. Maybe you don't realize how it hurts God when we do that. Maybe you think that it won't bring trouble into your life, that it won't cause you to feel guilty, and you continue to sin over and over again until your life looks a lot like what it did before you were saved. What do you do with that sin? Well, God makes it clear. He said you can solve that. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and bright to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. By sinning, once you're part of the family of God, what you're doing is run away from God. God said we were... His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. He wants to have good works. He wants us to, to just bring people into the kingdom by how we look. But we no longer look like Jesus, do we? We look apart from Jesus, and God doesn't want that. And he says if we confess, which means if we admit that we are doing wrong, and we turn back to him and do what's right, that's called repentance. And he cleanses us. He forgets those sins. And we can begin 
this new relationship, a relationship again with God, without that sin problem in our lives. And then we become more useful for good works, and we achieve those purposes that God has for us. And we receive God's blessings in our lives, and that's what we want. So children, the key is if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus and you find yourself in sin, just admit to God that I've done wrong, God, and you're right. And I'm going to turn around and come to you. And I want you to, Lord, forget my sins. And I want to do what you say. And I want your blessings in my life. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Denny. Please join us in singing an old favorite, Blessed Assurance. to special music, a piano medley presented by Lorena Lomato.
Thank you, Lorena. Now we go to God's Word with our senior pastor, Dr. Richard Emmons. Good morning, Graceway. Once again, I welcome you into my study here at home. And uh, once again, we want to study the scriptures together today. Social distancing has become the order of the day, hasn't it? It seems like everything we hear has to do with practicing this social distancing and the discussion is going on as to how long this will be the case for us. Um, some very interesting things are happening. The governor of Georgia has come under fire because he has begun to allow the state to move back into normal activities. And the question has been raised, how will you practice social distancing in hair salons and nail salons and tattoo parlors? Personally, I don't have a problem with tattoo parlors. I don't think I'm going to go. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. But um, it's interesting, the flack that he has received in all of this, isn't it? On the other side of the coin, there's a very interesting development that's taken place in a furniture factory in China. A factory called Yuya has found a creative way of encouraging their employees. They set up plexiglass between them so that they can kiss in the factory. And what we have is a, an employee and his wife or his girlfriend on either side of the plexiglass, as you can see on the screen, and they're practicing kissing in a safe way with social distancing. It's crazy the kinds of things that are happening in our world today. What's interesting is even animals have found out how to social distance. Cats can do it. As you can see here, they have figured it out. Um, seagulls are pretty good at social distancing and dogs can do it as well. Apparently, even pigeons are sensitive to social distancing these days. So <laughs> life is really interesting. You know, um, uh, I went into the, um, to the store and I wear my mask when I go into the store and, and it's crazy. Everybody is wearing a mask like this as we practice the social distancing that's just a part of our lives now. Um, some people are getting really creative in terms of what they do in the process. Here's an individual with a gas mask type of affair that he's using when he goes shopping. Here's another, a couple in, um, in the medieval armor. And I don't know what this other lady is doing in her scene. Um, these two characters are both dressed up in amazing costumes as they're engaged in that social distancing. The Apostle Paul created social distancing nearly 2,000 years ago. In the portion of scripture that we're going to deal with this morning, we find that he has created that behavior for a different kind of reason. And today, we're going to talk about social distancing. As we prepare ourselves for that, we want to read together 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. I'd like you to read it with me responsively this morning. I will read the first verse. Uh, you will respond with the second. Fran's actually going to lead you in your verses. So let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. 5 1. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind that does not exist even among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. For I, on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this, as though I were present. In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus. I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven, so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, 
also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with the immoral people of this world, or with the covetous and swindlers, or with the idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother, if he is an immoral person, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. Thank you. Please be seated. So we're back today in the book of 1 Corinthians. For those of you who are joining us who are not a regular part of, of Graceway, we were studying 1 Corinthians starting back in the first week of January. And that study was interrupted when we had to go online and we decided that we would give some services to preparing for the celebration of Easter. As of last week, we came back as we began to study 1 Corinthians again. The book of 1 Corinthians falls into two major divisions. The first is chapters 1 through 6. These are church issues that the Apostle Paul deals with. And then chapters 7 through 16, he answers questions that the Corinthians had asked him. Chapter 7, verse 1, begins with the words, Now concerning the things about which you wrote. Chapters 1 through 6 are things that they should have asked him about, but didn't. Things that he feels are more important. And so he deals with them. In the first four chapters, we dealt with the subject of divisions. Now as we move into chapter 5, there's another problem in the church. And Paul comes right at it head on. We tend to be maybe more delicate in many cases nowadays, but Paul deals with it directly. He says in 5.1, it's actually reported that there is immorality among you. Immorality of such a kind that does not even exist among the Gentiles, that a man should have his father's wife. In this context, Paul wants the Corinthians to do three things. He wants them to uh, respond to the circumstances of this individual. And he's going to broaden it from just this one person to people in like categories. What he says is that an openly sinful lifestyle that is perpetuated by a Christian or by someone who calls himself a Christian calls for three things. First, this openly sinful lifestyle calls for mourning. Paul says at the beginning of verse 2, you have become arrogant and have not mourned instead. It calls for mourning. What Paul's describing is a situation, he says, that not even unbelievers would practice. Paul's terminology in the New Testament, it's important for us to understand here, he regards three groups of people, or he considers the world to fall into three groups of people. The first group would be Christians, believers. The second group is Jewish people. And by Jewish people, when he refers to them, he's normally talking about Jewish people who are unbelievers. And then Gentiles. And when he talks about Gentiles as a category, he's normally talking about Gentiles who are not Christians. So when he says that this practice is something that would not even exist among the Gentiles, he means it would not even exist among Gentile unbelievers, among pagans. So this practice, this practice of a man living with his stepmother, is something that Paul sees as being very egregious. And he confronts the Corinthian church by saying to them that they have lost the proper balance between grace and truth. In, in John chapter 1, Jesus is described as the one who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And the thing that strikes me about Jesus' life 
is that he always seemed to have a proper balance between grace and truth. He didn't deny or ignore the fact that someone sinned, but neither was he so overboard with the truth that he wasn't gracious to people. And Paul is saying here to the Corinthians that they're overboard in grace. They have responded to this situation out of grace. And that has led them to become arrogant, to become puffed up is the word. The Corinthians have responded to this person by saying, well, this man is a believer, this man is part of the body, and we just need to accept his behavior, his lifestyle. And Paul doesn't like that at all. He says that as a result of that, they have become arrogant. We don't know why this has happened as it has. We don't know why this man is, is present in the body with this circumstance in his life. Was he influential? Was he well-liked? Was he a host to the church? Was he wealthy? Whatever it was, something had encouraged the Corinthians to overlook an egregious sin. And Paul is not happy with that at all. And so he wants them to maintain a balance of grace and truth. And that becomes obvious as we move through the chapter. And Paul goes on to say that he has judged the Corinthians from a distance. He says to them in verse 5, I on my part, though absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged this person. And so Paul, even though he's not there, what that tells us is that this sin is pretty cut and dried. It's, it's pretty much obvious. It doesn't take a lot of examination. There's not any room for explanation. There is no uh, attenuating circumstances that need to be dealt with. This is just flat out wrong. And that becomes clear because Paul has judged the person from the distance. Not only has he judged him from a distance, but he says, I have delivered him over to Satan. That's pretty strong, isn't it? For the apostle to deliver this person to Satan really runs in the face of what the Corinthians have done with this individual. And so it's kind of striking for us as we read it. He's delivered him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. The destruction of the flesh refers to his destruction as a physical person. That is the destruction of his physical life. Paul has turned him over for the destruction of the flesh, but it's interesting that he says, so that his soul might be delivered. Our translations tend to use the word saved, but the idea is delivered, that the soul would be delivered. So this individual, Paul is assuming, having given him over to Satan, who is the one who comes to kill and destroy. Remember in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, I've come to give life. But he has come to kill and to destroy. And so when Paul yields this man to the Spirit, he releases whatever protection might have been there, and he is assuming that this man might be destroyed. You have a couple of examples of that in the scriptures. In the Old Testament, there's the story of Achan. Remember, Achan stole some things from the city of Jericho. And when he was found out, God decreed that he should be destroyed, along with his family, interestingly enough. In the New Testament, we have the example of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. They were part of the body. They were believers. And they lied to Peter right in the assembly of the church. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 5 that Ananias fell down dead. They carried him out and buried him. His wife came in, told the same story. When Peter confronted her, she lied as well, and she fell down dead, and they carried her out and buried her. So these are believers who have committed unusual or egregious sins. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of glad that God doesn't strike down everybody who lies in church. But he communicated through that event the significance and how he feels about 
that issue. And in this case, the Apostle Paul is communicating how he feels about the sin of this individual. And so he has delivered him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, but the deliverance of the soul. One might ask the question, should we be doing that sort of thing today? And what I notice in the text is that Paul does not say that the Corinthians should be doing this. Nor are we instructed anywhere that I know of in the New Testament to practice such a thing. This is something that the Apostle Paul does in his apostolic authority, in his unique position, that I don't think we have the authority to do today. So Paul provides for the judgment of this individual. He says that the Corinthians ought to be mourning. When we encounter individuals in the body of Christ who are claiming to be believers, then there needs to be a proper chagrin, a proper mourning when those individuals are involved in obvious sin. As I said, Paul's going to broaden that out in a moment as he moves on in the chapter. So the first thing that this openly sinful lifestyle that's perpetrated by someone who calls himself a Christian calls for is for mourning. Not for patting ourselves on the back, not for being overly gracious. That's a little tough for us in our culture, isn't it? Um, we have a tendency to kind of bend over backwards. And one of the things that makes this kind of rampant in our churches today is the fact that we have a lot of really large churches. And in large churches, we don't really get to know each other. And so we don't know what's going on in somebody's life. And then a second problem that contributes to this whole thing is the fact that there are so many churches if somebody is um, involved in a behavior like this and is confronted by a brother or sister in the Lord, it's possible for them to pack up and move down the street to another church. And so what has happened is that there's been created a tendency for us to back off. A tendency for us to kind of be like the Corinthians. And what Paul's saying is there needs to be a proper balance of grace and truth, and in so doing, we should be mourning whenever we encounter an individual brother or sister who is engaged in this kind of lifestyle. The second thing that this behavior calls for is cleansing. Paul's calling for cleansing on the part of the believers. He says, beginning now in verse 6, that we need to recognize the pollution principle. The pollution principle stated this way, he says, Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? That's the principle from God's Word. That, that a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. Now, leaven is yeast. And Jesus used it in a positive sense in a parable in Matthew 13, when he said that the kingdom of heaven is like, is like a woman who puts a little bit of yeast in a large measure of flour. And when she puts it in and works it through, it's, it permeates all of that flour so that it's now useful for baking. Here Paul's using it in a negative sense, isn't he? It's very clear in the context. A little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. And so it's used here in a negative sense. Leaven now refers to sin. And what he's saying is that the sin of one person can become the sin of or can promote the sins of others around that person. A similar principle is given in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, when Paul says, uh, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. If you hang out with people who are sinful people, your tendency for doing good may be profoundly affected. So this is a principle that goes through the scriptures. It's a pollution principle. And Paul says the solution to that is to practice this feast of Passover. He says, beginning in verse 7, Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump 
Uh, I don't know if he's saying that we're like lumps on a log here uh, or not, but um, we're, we're to be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has also been sacrificed. Paul is taking the, the believers here back to the feast in the Jewish calendar. There are four feasts in the spring calendar of the Jews. The first one is Passover. Passover occurs on the 14th of Nisan. We just celebrated that with, um, with our Easter season a couple of weeks ago. On the 14th of Nisan, the Jewish people celebrated Passover as they looked back to their redemption from the nation of Israel. And then that was followed immediately on the 15th to the 21st of Nisan by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then, it's not dated exactly, but on a first day of the week, on a Sunday, the Jewish people were to bring their first fruits. The very first of their spring harvest was to be brought as a sacrifice to God, trusting that the rest of the harvest would come and they would enjoy the blessing of God. And then uh, Pentecost was counted 50 days from the Feast of First Fruits. And so 50 days later, also on a first day of the week, they would come with sacrifices that were designed to celebrate the completion of the spring harvest. These four feasts are pretty much tied together time-wise, and all four of them have been fulfilled by Jesus in the events surrounding his life and death and resurrection. Jesus is Passover. He was sacrificed on Passover. He is, as John says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so Jesus is the Passover. Whereas the Jewish people celebrated Passover up until that point, looking back to their deliverance from Egypt, from this point on, it was God's intention that Passover would be celebrated in the person of Jesus. It would be celebrated differently because of the different context. Now we celebrate Jesus as our redemption, as our deliverance. And so when we think of Passover, we think of Jesus as the Passover lamb. That was followed immediately by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the purpose of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is very interesting. When you think of unleavened bread, we're thinking of, of matzah. I have a couple of slices of matzah here. Actually, I, I prefer leavened bread myself. And um, I, I'm partial when it comes to leavened bread in terms of uh, something like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I have part of my lunch here in front of me. And um, I, I'm partial to rye bread. And so I like peanut butter and jelly on rye. My mind immediately went to um, this matzah, and I, I guess I'm weird, I thought immediately about peanut butter and jelly. And I thought, wouldn't peanut butter and jelly be awful on matzah? So I tried it. I have a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich made with matzah here. And I'm going to try a little bit of it. It's actually not bad. The peanut butter and jelly is good. The matzah, eh, not so. What was interesting to me, I went online and I asked, in the Jewish culture, is peanut butter and jelly on matzah acceptable? And I found a couple things really interesting. First of all, one article that I read said that peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are usually relegated to children. We usually think of school lunches. And on average, a, ch a child will have somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 peanut butter and jelly sandwiches by the time he finishes high school. And then, for adults, they will have maybe 10 a year. I want you to know, I like peanut butter and jelly, and so I have two or three a week at lunchtime on different days. I also found that uh, there was a Jewish writer, a man who graduated from college and has founded his own um, grocery business, food business, who said that he loved taking peanut butter and jelly on matzah during Passover. 
And I thought, well, okay. So I went to another website and they had the top eight foods, the top eight ways to eat matzah during Passover. And number six on the list was peanut butter and jelly matzah sandwich. So it is something that the Jewish people would have done. But we ask the question, why matzah? This is not nearly as good, and even the Jewish website that I read said that the person preferred bread that was uh, leavened and um, would much rather have that. Why would God instruct his people every year for eight days, actually nine or ten days, to eat unleavened bread? I think it goes back to the fact that he is establishing a break with the past. When the nation of Israel came out of Egypt, they carried their goods and their belongings on their backs. And they didn't have leaven for making bread. And they ate unleavened bread for those early days, and then they went to the, uh, the manna in the wilderness. So when God instituted these feasts back in the book of, Levit of Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 23, he said, I want my people to eat unleavened bread only for eight days. And what happens is there's a break with the past. They were to go through their homes and they were to remove all of the leaven from their homes. This man whose website I mentioned a moment ago told me that his, in his business, he sells everything that he possesses in his business that is leavened on a couple of days before Passover, and then he buys it back after the Feast of Unleavened Bread because he's trying to acknowledge uh, the, the behavior of his ancestors and so forth. He said he's not really a believer, but he wants to honor his ancestors. It's very interesting. I think what God is doing is pointing out that there's a be a break with the past. So the day before Passover, the Jewish people would go through their homes and get rid of all the leaven, and then they have only unleavened bread for eight or nine days. That is a whole new beginning. And what Paul is looking at for the Jewish people, or, or taking from the Jewish people from their culture, is an adaptation of that. In the same way that Jesus is now our Passover, Unleavened bread is now something that is to be celebrated with a new lifestyle. Paul says in both Colossians and Ephesians that as believers, we are to put off the old man and we are to put on the new man. And so he's saying to the Corinthians, rather than accepting this individual, we send him away, we refuse to associate with him, and we're to practice this feast of unleavened bread. That's cleansing. That refers to cleaning out our lives. It refers to committing ourselves to living a holy lifestyle. Earlier, Mr. Denny illustrated for us what happens when we come to Jesus and our sins are forgiven and our lives are changed. And then he demonstrated in his object lesson there what happens when sin comes into our lives. What happens when after we're saved and we are walking with Jesus, we sin, what do we do? And he provided the illustration for that. We practice confession, we receive cleansing, and we start over. And so what Paul's saying here in this passage when he says he wants them to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's clear he's not talking about going back to the Jewish culture because he says, celebrate this feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There's that balance, sincerity and truth. We're to be holy. We're to be cleansed. We're to live a lifestyle that is different and that is to bring with it a balance of grace and truth. And Paul wants the Corinthians to practice that. There's a third thing that this passage calls for. This openly sinful lifestyle, carried on by someone who claims to be a believer, calls for mourning, it calls for cleansing, 
And it calls for social distancing, doesn't it? Paul says, beginning in verse 9, I wrote in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Paul has already written to them not to associate with immoral people. That's a previous letter. It's likely that there are actually three or maybe even four Corinthian letters. And the real 1 Corinthians we don't have. Because he has written to them before. And he said, I wrote to you not to associate. The word associate is really interesting. It's actually three words in the Greek. It's the, it's the preposition uh, uh, ana, coupled with the word sun, S-U-N, coupled with the verb mignumi. And it literally means, sun ana mignumi, literally means not mixing together soon again, ana. And so it's not mixing together again. And what Paul's saying is, I don't want you mixing together again with this individual. This individual is living in an openly sinful lifestyle. He's not trying to cover it up. He's not trying to do anything with it. And Paul says, I don't want you to be associated with him. I don't want you to do that. Now, he makes it clear that he's not talking about associating with non-Christians here. He says in verse um, 10, I did not at all mean with the immoral people of the world. And then he names different categories, doesn't he? In these categories, he lists covetous, swindlers, idolaters, and down further, he's going to mention a couple of more, a drunkard, and so on. So these individuals are individuals that Paul says are these are habits, rather, of people in the world. And he says, I'm not saying you separate yourself from the people of the world. We don't expect the behavior of non-Christians that we expect of Christians. And Paul recognizes that. He says, I, I, I want to be friends with non-Christians. And I don't let their behavior cause me to cut myself off from them. But with Christians... It's different. And that's where he goes with all of this. And so he comes back to that subject and he says, I actually wrote to you, verse 11, not to associate, same word again, with any so-called brother. What he's saying is, I wrote to you not to mix together again with someone who calls himself a brother, someone who claims to be a Christian, who practices these kinds of things? Immorality, covetousness, idolatry, reviling, drunkards or swindlers, not even to eat with such a one. Eating is kind of the ultimate mark of fellowship. There's a lot of people that we know that we can just nod or say hi to. There are people that we know enough to talk with, like people at work and so on. But eating with somebody is, in, is a mark of intimacy. To have a meal with somebody is, is to enter into fellowship with that individual. And so Paul's saying that we ought not to associate with, and certainly we ought not to eat with, someone who is a believer and who claims to be born again, claims to be forgiven, claims to have his life changed, who refuses to remove obvious, open sin from his life. He says, don't fellowship with that person, don't eat with that person, don't associate with that person. That raises some um, sticky wickets with us, doesn't it? That raises some ticklish situations. Uh, one individual has raised the question, what, what about a family member? who is involved in this situation. Well, if the family member is not a believer, then that releases the situation. If the family member is a believer, <clears throat> it seems to me that's a little different than what we would do in the assembly of the local church. I think we still have to love family members. We still have to be there for them because we are bound to them regardless of their behavior. We don't stop loving them because they do something 
that is um, inappropriate, even if they're Christians, if they're family members. But that's different from individuals who are part of the local church, and especially if they might be involved in strategic areas, if they might be leaders or, or um, visible uh, in the local church. So it seems to me that we continue to love family members. Another area that's kind of sticky is, what about people who have addictions? That's a hard one, and I'm not sure exactly what to say, to be very honest with you. Seems to me that the Apostle Paul knew that there were people who were addicted to alcohol, or addicted to drugs, or addicted to certain kinds of behavior in his day, the same as ours. He's pretty strong here. <clears throat> and what he's saying is, we expect that individuals who claim to be a Christian, who claim to have experienced a new birth, we expect them to put on a new lifestyle. So maybe, maybe we need to be more aggressive in coming around individuals who are addicted. And maybe we need to kind of fence them in more somehow. I don't know exactly. And I suppose there's some area for personal decision making in that regard. But in terms of the person's presence and participation in the body of Christ, I have to go with the Apostle Paul. He says that he, he is turning that individual over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. I don't have the authority to do that. I don't think he's saying that we should do that. But he is saying that we, that we ought to be gracious but not arrogant, that we ought to be mourning that individual's behavior, that we ought to be cleansing our own lives and the life of the church to the best of our ability, and thirdly, that we ought to be social distancing, that we should not associate with or fellowship with individuals who are bound and determined to go in that direction. That's a tough one, isn't it? It's difficult for us. So in this passage of scripture, the Apostle Paul is saying that in a, here's the big idea, here's the bottom line. The believer's openly sinful lifestyle requires social distancing, or we could call it spiritual distancing. It requires that there still be a balance of grace and truth. And so I think three things we can take away from this. Number one, I want to be sure that I'm not continuing in some kind of non-Christian lifestyle. We need to be careful and examine our own lives, that we're not doing something that is a part of the old life and we're justifying it just because it used to be a part of my life. Secondly, I think what Paul is saying is that we need to lovingly, gently confront those in the body who have open issues of sinful lifestyle. I don't think he's saying we should be on a witch hunt. We should not be poking around in people's lives. We're not going looking for problems. But when something is open and apparent, then I think we need to talk to that individual. Galatians 6 says that we go to that person with a gentle, loving spirit lest we ourselves also fall into sin. And so I think we need to confront in a gentle and loving and caring way. That means we build a relationship. That means, that means we, don't, we don't just go after someone, but we're seeking to uh, help individuals. And then thirdly, this passage seems to say that we ought to be celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That that ought to be something that we highlight not going back to the Jewish culture, because that has been changed by, by Jesus. Unleavened bread now means a determination to celebrate with simplicity and truth. It means to put on the new man, to walk with Jesus. I hope that you will do that as you walk in, with Jesus in this passage. The two obvious problems or sins that we could uh, respond in this is number one, to be overly judgmental, or number two, to be overly gracious.
We don't want either one of those. We want to find the proper balance of grace and truth in all that we do. So as you walk with Jesus this week, as you practice the social dis distancing that we have to do in our culture right now, um, walk with grace and truth. Reach out to the people around you. Relate to them in the grace and truth of the Lord Jesus. Until I meet you again, this way or in person, may God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Now, one of the first things that we can do as a church when we're responding to what Christ has done for us is we can come to him with thankful hearts and thanksgiving. So let's take this song as an opportunity to just express how thankful we are that Christ has cleansed us, that he has made us pure by his blood, and that he offers it for all who would believe. Let's join in singing Jesus' thank you.
We hope you have been blessed by worshiping with us today. May you know Christ's grace and peace this week.